Okay, an expectant silence, that's great. <laughs> this, this object is for passing around the audience, I'm sure. So um, what we want to do is get beyond formalities as quickly as possible and invite a response. So um, that's, that's certainly the case, but in the, in the first instance. Um, I just wanted to say and offer sincere thanks um, to all who have made this possible, this uh, publication, the two in fact. And um, that, that starts with uh, Artifice and Anna Danley, uh, so that's great. She's uh, picked this up from, I, I have to say, the pieces that were left at a certain point, it's fair to say, I think, um, as Artifice took a, a turn for the worse and then were acquired happily. So this is Artifice 2, as it were. Um, and obviously, for tonight's event here in the Charter House, um, Anne Kendrick, the master, and Domin Dominic Tickell, I saw. Um, and um, yeah, this was a, a just, to, just to answer why we're here in a way, is uh, this was a, a wonderful um, job that I think we won in competition. And uh, it was for a project called Revealing the Charter House. Um, this is a foundation that goes right back to the plague of 1368 or 48. Thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> and yeah, you know, and uh, so the square, I'm sure many of you know this, but the square was a burial ground effectively from the plague. And uh, one Walter de Manny, decided thereafter to, to establish a Carthusian monastery here. So uh, it was one of the largest Carthusian monasteries in Europe, certainly. Um, and uh, having not knowing that much about the Carthusians, um, I did take myself to, um, to see the mothership, which is the, is the most beautifully set monastery. Um, in near Grenoble, um, above Grenoble, uh, and the uh, the way in which the uh, the brotherhood here, the monks, were um, were brutally suppressed um, because Thomas More had something to do with the institution. This was a very strong centre um, of of pushing back at the the dissolution. Uh, but famously, the prior was hung, drawn, and quartered, and his arm pinned to the gate over there. Um, there were a number of, uh, of, of uh, monks who were taken to the tower, so some 17 martyrs, and it became a cause celeb in Europe, the way in which this institution had been treated. Um, but the remains, miraculously, of, of some of the portals that you find in uh, Carthusian monasteries, uh, it, there's, there's this tension between the lay brotherhoods and the, and the monks themselves, um, and a, a sort of sense of not touching. So um, the doors into what were workshops on the ground floor and uh, prayer space and bedroom above, um, are still there to be seen in, in ghostly form in a bit of the cloister, so you can, you can sense that. And you can sense the 20, 23 uh, houses that, that made this. You can st still sense the scale of that. Uh, there's a very beautiful vellum um, that stretches about two-thirds of this table, um, which has the, the irrigation, the water coursing, marked on for future generations to know where to get to a stopcock or the equivalent. <laughs> um, really plumbing, and, and that they, they're some of the best, those, those little documents, some of the best tracings of history, I think. Um, certainly at Canterbury Cathedral, that's the way we know about the Norman uh, church and so on. Uh, anyway, so that still remains, and uh, whilst the, the building transformed extraordinarily um, through the uh, 15th and 16th century and then in, uh, it became a, a bequest um, of an almshouse and a school rather beautifully. And this is a living, a living, a living space, it's not a museum piece. Um, there are 40 brothers here who still live here with an infirmary and, and that goes on. But the time was felt right 
for um, this to be opened up, um, particularly to school children. So uh, in the post-war period, um, there were three brothers' rooms here um, from the almshouse, and uh, this was a bombed site, actually. So we were able to transform this room into a schoolroom, and that's something wonderful. School children come at 10 o'clock in the morning, come with a packed lunch, they come in here, they're able to uh, work their way through various parts of the stratigraphy, complex stratigraphy of, uh, of, of history, and leave, um, I, I think, thrilled at the end of the day. So that was the prime purpose, but it also allowed us to create a small museum um, uh, in one section, and then the, the new entrance, so the new entrance <coughs> and, and the metalwork. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity of working here. It's been great. It was actually, I think it's, it has been, it has worked very well. This space was a complete secret. So there was literally a fig tree at the entrance. Um, and I think it has, uh, has gone well beyond the expectations of the Museum of London, who uh, the Charterhouse's partner here, um, and to create a very nice equivalence to their uh, their own operation in the museum as it stands today and will, in different circumstances, stand just beyond this, obviously. Anyway, so uh, that's, that's why we're here. And um, the other part is really to ask some questions of, uh, of my guests, and principally and firstly, Joseph Rickward. So um, it's wonderful that Joseph uh, has... Uh, been able to and happily to write an introduction that reflects incredibly um, poignantly and, and clearly on the work which you've looked at you know I can only say with incredible intensity in, in my opinion um, and to Jay Merrick who has um, written the text so uh, both Jay and Eddie um, for volume three which is reprinted um, and part of now the, this assemble, assembly of volume three and four. Um, Eddie and I, and then Jay and I, kind of went to every building, as Wilfred Wang had, uh, had asked to do. Um, uh, uh, that, that sounds obvious, but actually it takes a lot of time, and it's, uh, it's, it's in this day and age, I think, very important to make those visits and to discuss the work, so an open discourse. Um, and I think that uh, it, I, I, I would start, actually, um, by just going back to Volume 3, if I might, mm -hmm. and to Eddie, and to ask you, uh, the, the missing participant here, uh, obviously, is, is Dalibor, and uh, Dalibor wrote the introduction, Dalibor Vaisley, to the first three volumes of our work, and that was incredibly important. And I think he, um, in the third volume, um, he talks about continuity and the, the issue of context, um, and that was reflected, and, and the importance of the street, those basic archetypes of the urban condition, which are so important. Um, uh, and I think that's something that you picked up on. So if we have a brief discourse around the three um, here and, uh, and then open it to the floor, I think that would be, that would be a very nice way of beginning. Um, so Eddie, you had a perception that most of the work in volume three um, was focused, I think, around London. Yeah. And you therefore drew an essay around that, and maybe you would like to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the <coughs> Dalibor's essay was, as you say, that this continuity, which is obviously a, a something deep in your past as well, the, the continuity and uh, tradition. And um, I, 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 I had two ideas. I think one, maybe I only articulated after I wrote it, but the, the, the other was really that it seemed to me that actually very few architects had taken the opportunity to work in depth at um, a, a, a particular scale in very specific parts of the city. And in particular, it was Mayfair and the city, which I thought was, was fascinating because the, 
the city was undergoing, this was exactly the period the city was undergoing this terrific change. <coughs> and uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of leap in scale. And you were working in a way at a, a kind of, uh, at the time, now you've gone on to the mega scale, but at the time you were in the, the, the kind of in-between scale, the sort of transitional. And it, it seemed to me that there was, um, there, is, there was a moment in city architecture which was fascinating between, say, 1890 or 1900 and 1930, the kind of late Edwardian, early deco, <coughs> which you'd drawn on, and particularly with the, with the Stock Exchange building, there was this kind of expressionist uh, uh, feel to it, but also a sort of acknowledgement of, uh, implicit acknowledgement of the street plan, of the complexity of the Roman plan, and then the overlay of the medieval plan, and how you could draw an architecture from the, the topography and the, the various layers of the city, which is something I was very interested in. And then, similarly in Mayfair, there was this quite curious hybrid of the, uh, the sort of the Georgian, the, uh, what, what, what you could call it, the sort of the townhouse, the Georgian uh, tradition of the, of the townhouse as opposed to the country house. And then this kind of rather, um, what's the word, um, frivolous architecture, like the Pinay store mm -hmm. on Bond Street. This is slightly uh, 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 sort of ed Edwardian, um, Sort of English version of Van Nouveau, which was quite delicate and very, very different to the, to the stolidity of the brick houses. And then, forgive me if I'm talking too much, and then fr tying those together, I thought what was interesting, it seemed to me, about, about the, the, that period of, of your work was uh, the depth. That there's obviously a, a kind of an intellectual depth. Dalibor picked up on that, which is you know, welcome and unusual maybe in, in contemporary architecture. But there was a depth in the way it reached into the earth, in the way it reached into the archaeology of the city, the tracing the, the shapes and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the kind of former manifestations of the street plan. But more specifically, there was a depth in the facade. There was a depth in the, the articulation of the surface. Um, and that, I think, it, it kind of, that kind of sculptural modelling where you were, you were ahead of the pack. Now, now others are doing it, but at the time it was a, it was a moment of glass, sheet glass facades. And I think that complexity and depth that you'd brought to the, the architecture of Mayfair and the city was absolutely fascinating. And some of the, I was lucky, I felt lucky to be working on those buildings because they were so intriguing. Um, so that's it, depth and <laughs> continuity. I won't talk anymore. <laughs> Someone else can talk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jay, could you um, perhaps, if we take that, that manifestation through material and so on, would it be possible to ask you um, a little bit about your response, having uh, been through the buildings that followed? Um, um, we tend to work with the books from a, uh, a bridging project that becomes a completed project. Um, about your impression of um, how they come to be. Um, you've heard the stories. Um, there's, a sort of, there's a sort of interest, I think, in beyond architectural practice um, in this city, uh, how one gets to make buildings, perhaps. Hmm. First thing I should, uh, should say that um, I, ha I have to thank uh, José for uh, editing my work very, very assiduously. Um, I, I remember the first, um, first attempt at my preface, and, and he sent me a note saying, it reads like Mozart. <laughs> I felt very, very happy for a split second until it, <laughs> until it occurred to me that maybe, maybe he hated Mozart, and this was his way of, of dealing with me. In any case, thank you, Jose. Very, very delightful to work uh, with you on this. Um, <coughs> I'd like to say that visiting the buildings uh, was, for me, very unusual. I've, I've done three or four monograph texts, central texts, <coughs> strange enough, all for modernist architects, high-tech architects. And 
every building wasn't visited. I mean, they're busy people, they're, that's no reflection on them. Um, and so, and everything was quite compact. Uh, this took a long time. And, and I think it took a long time. And it was very interesting for me because everything happened quite slowly, quite thoughtfully. There was no rush to grasp a building quickly. And if you write about buildings all the time, then you, you generally have to, it's an in-out operation, commando operation. This was absolutely not. So everything was, every building was visited. They were considered very thoughtfully, very slowly, no rush to jump to any conclusions. And that obviously leads to the fact that these buildings were, their design and their design process and the thought that went into them, it, it becomes very, very apparent how much thought goes into these buildings. I'm, well, I, I want to come to another point. I want to quote Eddie um, in a minute. Um, I think, I, I think when you, we, we, we live in a kind of time of, uh, I think the situationists sp spoke about something like the decor of spectacle and the price of things. And I think most architecture um, in our cities and towns fall, falls into that category. Um, but I'd like to just quote one thing, which I think is interesting. There's a remark in Eddie's book, in his um, introduction to volume three, and he, uh, that, uh, 2015, and he says, whatever the architectural and structural change, and by that he means the city, Westminster and Southwark, um, uh, they have maintained a certain psychogeography, enough of the traces of history and use to preserve at least a spirit of the particular, the place. And of course, we, we all agree with that. Uh, my question is, uh, we, you let, don't have to answer it now, I'm just raising I, I would it. just apologise um, for using the word psychogeography, if I may. <laughs> no, no, fine. But, but my question is, yes, of course, we all understand that. But at what point do the traces become ineffective in, in signalling a deeper sense of place? We, we can come back to that. And, and I, th I think Eric, uh, Eric's architecture and the practices architecture, um, it, it's, not, it's not just about tradition in a kind of lost sense, in, in a sentimental sense. It's got really nothing much to do with that. I think there are, I think there are two dynamics, which again I'm going to quote. Um, I found, uh, this, this is where I think it's coming from. I, I'll simply read the quote and tell you who it is at the end. <coughs> uh, he's talking about po poets and poetry, but it's, it's all interchangeable. Um, whereas if we approach a poet uh, uh, without this prejudice, that is to say um, the prejudice of identifying um, and celebrating individual differences in creativity, something apparently new, isolated, unexpected. It's too often singled out. Whereas if we approach a poet without this prejudice, we shall often find that not only the best, but the most individual parts of his work may be those in which the dead poets, his ancestors, assert their immortality most vigorously. And I don't mean the impressionable period of adolescence, but the period of full maturity. Yet if the only form of tradition of handing down consisted in following the ways of the immediate generation before us in a blind or timid adherence to its successes, tradition, in quotes, should positively be discouraged. <coughs> we have seen many such simple currents soon lost in the sand, and novelty is better than repetition. Tradition is a matter of much wider significance. It cannot be inherited, and if you want it, you must obtain it by great labor. It involves in the first place the historical sense, and the historical sense involves a perception not only of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. The historical sense compels a man to write or to design, not merely with his own generation in his bones, but with the feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe from Homer, and within it the whole of the literature of his own country, uh, a simultaneous existence and composes a simultaneous order. This historical sense, which is a sense of the timeless as well as of the temporal, and of the timeless and of the temporal together, is what makes a writer, 
an architect, traditional, and it is at the same time what makes a writer most acutely conscious of his place in time and his own contemporaneity. And I think, I think that's, that's Eliot, and I think that sums up some sort of basic condition that uh, Eric and the practice are seeking. My impression, though, is that it goes beyond that. The thing that sticks out for me, and I've become quite alert to it <coughs> through, through the years, is um, an inclination towards uh, a certain surreality, a certain kind of shaking of the condition. And I find this, this very, very interesting. Uh, in, in these buildings, not all of them, not, not this one, for example, not the, uh, uh, not the factory. Um, but the other, the other thing to point out is that how does the practice manage to achieve this in a, in a, in a, in a development and planning situation, which for the most part is producing uh, banal buildings or really, really shocking buildings? Um, and it would, be, it, it, would be, it would be unfair of me to mention particular buildings. I mean, it would be unfair of me to mention the, 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 the two buildings at the end of the Victoria development, for example. Um, the, uh, the, the two Nova buildings. It would be very unfair. But I mean, buildings like this, are, they, they appear, and they're just, if you read the justifications for these buildings from the architect, they're just unbelievable. And, and uh, Peter will have something to say about this. How, how, does, it get to, how does it get to a planning committee um, and for the planning committee to see the first visuals and just say, leave the room? We're not talking about this. Leave the room. Um, the fact that it's possible for um, Eric to uh, produce, the, design these buildings and convince the... Um, the planners to put them through. The new, the new building under construction in Fenchurch Street is a very good example. Uh, Peter's involved in that. that is, that's a dynamic relationship between planning and architecture, which will, I think, produce a, a, a very, very interesting building. Um, but how is it that some practices uh, can produce a building of craft and of, of some sense of I won't say timeless, but you know, time full continuity. Uh, and why isn't more asked for by the planners? This, this keeps coming back. And, and I don't think that the media particularly helps. I remember about um, <coughs> eight years ago when I was the, the critic for The Independent, the, uh, the deputy uh, arts editor um, said to me, um, could she have a piece on red buildings? It's all become kind of spectacle and, and so on and so forth. I would like to, uh, you know, I think if this discussion opens up, I'd, I'd love to have your opinions on the, the planning situation and, and how you get, get through that. How do you get these wonderfully crafted buildings through and, you know, and and how, how are so many architects not really trying hard enough? Well, there's the stone cast into the very, very <laughs> calm pond. And before we go there, I would hope to turn to Joseph, if I, if I might, who was, um, who, uh, when I, I asked, um, uh, considered and, and then agreed to write, I think for a number of reasons, um, not least um, as he, says very eloquently in his introduction that normally um, three parts are a whole and this being the fourth marks a new beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, there was that. But uh, actually, um, I think the, the response was that you, you wanted to write about type and what type yes. meant. And I, I was thrilled by that, but also by the, the outcome, uh, your essay, um, which well beyond the, the issues of the projects, reaches for uh, a continuing, I think, debate about type. Well, 
I suppose it's inevitable that we should have to talk about type at some point, because it is, after all, the bounden duty of most architects to deal with type and with, with type as an insertion in the city. And um, I think that is, to me, one of the marks of your achievement, is to be able to introduce variations into type in such a way that it is part of the street and yet it registers its individuality. Now, at the most extreme, of course, is, is the St. James's project. But it's really the ones in Bond Street as well. There are, the, there are these facades which are inserted in between other facades and which somehow make that one mark of distinction in the street. And I think that's a great achievement. Um, I think underestimated and I think perhaps sometimes neglected. That's why I wanted to point attention to it. Mm. I think in the essay you write about type in relation to um, you know, this, this, the ones you refer to are, are commercial buildings, effectively. Yes. Um, <coughs> but you cast the net much wider in terms of London yeah. and the type. Yes. Yes, it's, it's very interesting that about um, 20 or 30 years ago, I was approached by an American developer who was proposing in the Middle West to build, to build the whole of Wren's plan for London, a complete replica. Um, it seemed aberrant to me, but I must say one, one of the first things that occurred to me is I said to him, what are you going to do with St Paul's? <laughs> and he said, it'll be a youth club. <laughs> well, it went the way of all flesh, that plan. Well, I, 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 uh, I thank you hugely. I think the other, the other thing uh, that I had completely forgotten about, actually, was, um, was th that you drew to attention was the note about our first meeting. And I don't know quite how that happened. I think Dalibor engineered that. Did he? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, Joseph wanted some drawing help uh, for a competition that then took us to Jerusalem. That's right. And uh, to a meeting with Alison Smithson, amongst others. Yes. Who were all submitting their... Yes. Anyway, uh, from my lonely position, I enjoyed hugely uh, working on it. And you come to remind me of that <laughs> in well, this... It was in, a long time ago. ago. <laughs> it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So um, it has been a, uh, a, a, a wonderful process. I think Joseph actually... I always remember giving you a lift home from Cambridge at a point when there was a job that was advertised, which eventually I managed to get for yeah. an assistant lecturer. And I, uh, somewhere, somewhere, a very ropey car actually got you to the outskirts of London and asked your advice. Uh, and I said, well, do you think I should um, actually apply for this? And you looked at me wryly um, and said, as long as you don't mind them saying Refusing you, that was it. Yeah, very good <laughs> advice, very good <laughs> advice. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, so there it is. I, you know, we, I, I will come back to the thanks, but um, perhaps we can pick up one or two of those points. Um, I don't know if uh, from the floor Peter um, wants to pick up the... Uh, the thorny question of planning and, um, and, uh, and that process of the reactive and the proactive. I, I think uh, the point that uh, Jay's brought up is a very important one, that the product of good architecture depends on having a triumvirate. You've got to have good planning and good development to go with the good architecture or it will never happen. Uh, that's why I always said to developers, come and see me at day one come to me at the back of the envelope stage, but please make sure the architect doesn't draw on the envelope first. Because I've always felt that the architect, the planner and the developer needed to sit down together on day one so that the developer could, of course, provide the brief that he had for what was necessary to make the site economically viable, 
but equally the planner could provide the architect with the brief that was necessary for the surroundings, for the community, uh, and for the public aspects of that building. Uh, and I, I always felt that the, the product of, uh, the, the, the sign of a really good architect, and I would certainly put you in this category, was an architect that was prepared to come to those sort of meetings with an open mind, to receive both briefs and then go away and start thinking about the problem and coming up with the best solution for that problem, rather than coming in with the client with a scheme already developed, where there was no scope for the place, for the community, for the involvement of those who would have to deliver. Um, it was simply a done and dusted Piper modelled scheme. Uh, and you never came into that category. But I, I think the sad thing now, of course, is that planning is in such a state. Um, Gordon Brown and George Osborne have between them destroyed the British planning system, nothing short of that, uh, in the light of believing that everything they've been told by the development sector must be correct, and that um, lots of cranes on the skyline, doesn't matter whether it's a rabid socialist like Livingston or a mad right winger like Boris Johnson, um, they, they all worshipped cranes on the skyline and none of them asked what they were building. And so all the way from Greenwich to Battersea we've now got crap. And not only crap, but useless crap, bad land use, investment residential development, which is no good for London, it's no good, it doesn't provide homes, but local authorities have got no power to refuse it any longer. If they do, it'll be overturned by the Mayor of London, or if not him, then by the government, because development must be a good thing. I don't know how we're going to get this back, but I'm not aware of a planning authority left in the country where there's a planner who's answerable directly to the chief executive any longer. Planning is now well down the pecking order. When I left the city, I wasn't replaced. I was made redundant. The same happened in Westminster. Um, if, if the London boroughs don't have somebody responsible for planning who is answerable to the chief executive of that organisation, then it indicates how unimportant planning is. And that's all come, I'm afraid, from central government. So until we rediscover planning in this country, it's entirely down to developers and architects to carry the torch between them. Because frankly, we don't have a role any longer. Wow. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, can we open it to the floor? Or if not, we'll... Sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let... Yeah. Let, let me ah. her, mm. with, <coughs> with one of your observations. First off, um, a cursory glance uh, at uh, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of homes that are stuck in the planning system at the moment will give the lie to the idea that the development industry or the house building industry gets an easy ride. That's just not true. Second, uh, there was a sort of suggestion, I think, from Jay, somehow that good architecture doesn't get planning permission or has a harder time getting it. No, no. The, 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 okay. There was the, uh, the, the, the problem about how does Eric get a planning permission when these awful buildings by lesser architects do get planning permission? It's a fluke. It seems a fluke. Well, it isn't a fluke at all. And I would say that, by and large, um, good architecture always gets planning permission. In fact, you know, architects like Michael Hopp has never failed to get a planning permission in London or anywhere else in Britain, as far as I know. So I think one has to temper this. It's not the case that the struggling artist architects have a really hard time and everybody hates what they do. It happens occasionally, but it happens with all sorts of architects for all sorts of malign reasons. And the truth is, which, which is, as you know, the reason that the area around Victoria Station is a mess is a very complex one, but let's put it this way, at the heart of it was a greedy and absurd demand for 200 million pounds on the part of the mayor and Westminster Council and anyone else who thought they could get their snout in the trough of a developer who couldn't afford to do the best scheme and therefore ended up doing something which is hopelessly compromised <coughs> and which has very little to do with the individual contributions of the architects, the best of which, Benson and Forsyth, managed to survive the whole process. So I think the truth is, as, as Peter well knows, the circumstances in which good or bad architecture flourishes or doesn't is so dependent 
uh, on clients and a whole series of contingent matters, which is why any building is a wonderful historical nugget. Because if you understand the story of who did it, why they did it, how it was designed like that, how it was procured, then you will have an almost complete history uh, of the times in a single piece of architecture which explains its ongoing fascination. <laughs> If I respond, I, I, yeah. forgive me, um, dragging the that's subject it, away from you and our lovely books. No, that's what it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ride over but that one. My, my, my dad was born in Victoria Street. And uh, although I've never lived there, I have a kind of uh, an interest in it. And I see Paddy uh, and, and Claudia uh, grinning at the back there. Um, you know, they're responsible for the pretty much the, the, the you know, well actually by far the best things in Victoria Street now. But it, it's interesting, I think, and it is a very London phenomenon, that Victoria was always a bit of a bloody mess. And that, these things do, it's I think somehow th there's something that mitigates in this city about being able to solve particular problems. There's something that mitigates against that. Certain areas, you know, Vauxhall, Victoria, I don't know, probably um, the, the bit of Shoreditch where it hits Liverpool Street. They've never, they've, they've always been kind of back ends, sort of dog-legged back ends. And, you know, maybe we're, maybe they are impossible to solve, you know, but there is, there, you, you have touches of beauty and relief in these places and then, uh, and then pain, endless pain surrounding them. <laughs> uh, you know, it'd be quite interesting to see what, what Paddy thinks about this, actually, because you did manage, to, you have managed to, to build a couple of very, you know, elegant, um, yeah, contributions there, which is which seems. So I think what you know what Jay was saying in a way is that the the pain is sometimes rewarded. You know, we, we see in Eric's work occasionally that it, it, it's much harder to do what Eric does than it is to just knock up a, a glass block, and not everyone's prepared to do that. And I think in a way that's why we, that's why we've got a room full of people here because people appreciate that effort. But sometimes areas cannot be. Neighbourhoods cannot be solved. They just don't lend themselves to it. Paddy, tell me what you, what you think about Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Well, as you probably all know, we've just made a planning application to try to fix it. Um, so we're doing the bits of Nova, um, which are planning permissions two and three. So the incredible complexity that you're alluding to, I've been working on the job. We have been doing it for... 12 and a half years and I think um, you're right that it is one of those areas of London which is a strange ragtaggle of bits and pieces and partly that's to do with its geography, um, its relationship to technology, in, in particular sewers and underground constraints which drain land and make it possible to build on. So the, the train line comes in the old canal basin. John Snow discovered that standing water caused cholera so they abandon that in the city and then they realize actually you can put a train line in the bottom of a canal basin um, they were then building houses in kent and hampshire and down to sussex you could get people from this, the countryside into london in a quarter of an hour it took you two hours to get across london so they decided then to build a, uh, to put trains under the ground and that kind of cuts off one side from the other so there's a kind of there's a load of stuff in here i remember talking to dalibor um about this at length um, in 2012 when I interviewed him as a part of kind of PhD research and something for the Venice Biennale and he, he pointed out that there's a series of these bits of London like Aldwych where you get um, and you see it illustrated in his in his book where the, the he shows the effect of the train lines coming into North London where you get these kind of disruptions in uh, planning or disruptions in kind of planning as architecture aesthetics and you get something else happening, which is the condition of the fragment, which is both kind of terrifying because it's broken, but also points towards the possibility of a kind of recovery of something else, continuity within discontinuity. And that reading of place is not a formalistic one. It deals with sociology, history, geography, use. And Dalibor wasn't a snob. And so uh, nobody, I don't think, ever thought that Eric and I would be doing office buildings, but actually what we're doing is city and people have to work somewhere most most people work in offices in city of london etc and so if you approach that with a kind of kind of generosity of spirit that you could make the best place people 
want to work in as possible, and um, that then brings you to questions of depth of the facade and e ecology, understood as kind of you know ethical, artistic dimension to architecture. You're suddenly sort of a mile away from the conversation about mappings and tracings and form making, which is the kind of way in which a lot of the stuff that gets built is discussed at a, a very kind of high level. There's you know, architects working in these sorts of situations, so, you know, they're Harvard graduates, UCL graduates, they're not stupid people, they're very erudite, very articulate. But there's something, I think, that um, uh, Peter Carl calls civic depth, which was, which has to do, civic depth, Peter, which he can probably talk about better than I, but has to do with the metabolism of the city, has to do with the relationship between a high street and its hinterland, and actually, Victoria, if you look to the south of it, there's Vincent Square, there's kind of decent housing, there's the Abbey, there's the Cathedral, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there's hotels, and each of those buildings, as well as being within something which is broken, are themselves, uh, they're, they're making as much as possible a world, they're making a site, and they have um, layers of inhabitation that go from the individual to a living room to a balcony to to the street, to the city, and I think that's the the thing that um, uh, will, if if possible, redeem what comes next. So we're lucky at the moment. We're working on a site. There's a theatre, and we're putting a library there, and there's a pub. And Lee Polisano said to me, "It's not fair, Paddy. You've got all the programme, and you've got all the old stuff." And he was kind of wryly remarking, "I think it's right. You know, it's just not finished." Um, we recently realised there was a limit to what we could do, so we invited Liza Fjorn Muff to get involved to work with us on the public realm, and um, they've, they've kind of flipped it slightly, and, and therefore the question of the fact that when you get a library, you get authors coming, and you have children, and when you have a theatre, you have actors. And so suddenly, the, the topography of the site, which is sloped and is responding to the, the sewers and train lines, etc., has a kind of strange disjunction, but that immediately creates the possibility for the programme within the buildings to relate to the landscape. That, in essence, I, the connection between the inside and the outside, I, an architect who can you know, care about the circumstances of somebody at their desk, the amount of daylight and sunlight and glare of somebody living in a building, and the broader context of, of, of their well-being in the city is probably what's mostly missing. You know, pe 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 people design things top-down, as objects, and uh, it becomes about sculptural form. People talk about formalism, but they don't understand about formal and informal life. Mostly these things are kind of actually informal, i.e. they lack type. Um, they're not clear linguistically, they're not nuanced. Um, and I think that's really what um, the difference is. But the, but the problem with planning is that that type of planning takes decades. And there's, um, at certain points, you know, this is kind of the best you can get out of people. There's, there's a sort of, um, you know, some, something has to be built because there's been a, a, something needs, needs to happen. I, th I think, though, this conversation is evolving. I, I literally think that what, what is happening is that there's, there are paradigms that exist within architecture schools and within people's consciousness about what we should be doing. And... I think we're quite lucky now because we've, I think, got over, our, uh, as a profession, I mean, um, our guilt and horror about postmodernism. You know, it's a bit like, you know, the Germans and the war. It, it wasn't me, mate. You know, there, there was a whole kind of shift from, you know, people doing high tech to doing POMO, and then suddenly they're doing modernism again with lots of colours because that's going to solve the problem of people not getting space and light and, and stuff. Uh, and, and I think that uh, actually uh, David Chipfield and Eric you know, come from a generation with much more nuanced understanding of, of history and, and the, 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 the primary importance of the city and, and of the individual. I think what struck me, just to kind of get back to Eric for a bit, because hopefully I sort of tried to... I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the something Dalibor wrote in the first um, book about Eric where he, he, he noticed that this kind of strange trajectory of being at the Royal College doing furniture things which were kind of scale of 
body, scale of room, and then doing buildings. That, 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 that actually, the buildings have these two scales in them at once, or at least. So they work as a room, they work as city, they work as silhouette, they work as type, they also work as urban room. So things which are ordinarily in a building, industrial design, scaled up by high tech to an object, which is kind of straining to try and connect to the world and people. That's, that doesn't seem to be how Eric, Eric's imagination works. It comes out of the drawing, it comes out of the hand. There's obviously lots of computing going on, but that computing is kind of registering a different scale. I, I kind of think actually how all this stuff, this bad stuff happens because people don't work properly. The first meeting I went to with Westminster, I brought along a scrappy card model. And one of, the, one of the guys there, you know, very senior guy, said, um, oh, we apologize for Paddy's model. Um, uh, he, he, uh, um, he makes models before he's designed the building. And everything else <laughs> in the room, everything else in the room was models by Pipers that cost 50 grand, which is kind of, you know, and you can see you can't cut them, you can't, you can't look at them properly, you're distant. There's, there's a kind, I think it's quite literally, it's how you draw how you how you make models, how you look, how you talk, how you think. Um, I think we owe a lot of this to, to Dalibor, very obviously. But then obviously there's there's lots of other people involved in this. There was a kind of tradition of of within British architecture. It's 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 not gone. It's just got a bit submerged by other influences. Well, that that reminds me of uh, our, our first um, encounter actually with a developer who was Stuart Lipton, and uh, to to design his offices in some ridiculously short period of time. Um, we, had, we had worked night and day and there were certain sort of glitches in the, in the drawings. It was done so quickly that they were translated into stonemason's hands and um, built that way with the indecision of various patterns and so on. It was, it was phenomenal. But taking in the uh, drawings, actually, um, this is going in a, in a way back to needing, <coughs> in terms of the commercial world anyway, a client who has an ambition. Um, that first meeting was extraordinary because uh, he audibly kind of said, in order that I could hear it, a bit amateurish, <laughs> like your model. And then, then proceeded to turn over the drawings and, and said, I, I don't want to look at the drawings. I, Tell me about the culture of my organisation. I thought it was an incredibly interesting. So, you know, that allowed me out of the corner of the boxing ring um, and into into the fray. And I actually, you know, we kind of been on reasonably friendly terms ever since. So, um, but anyway, yeah, you know. But uh, I, I, the triumvirate, it does seem to me that it's absolutely critical, and that in fact, if I think back to the projects that we've done, it has it has been essentially. There are many sagas in terms of the conversations over, over, over planning, and I won't bore everyone with those now, but that sort of sense of, of being the arbitrator between the developer's bottom line and the obvious aspirations that all planning authorities have, whether they fulfill those in reasonable ways or not, that is to do with bettering their patch, you know, is 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 a role that we have that bridges between architecture and civic design or you know urban design and i think that that has been is and continues to be a great adventure because whilst I, I, one is amazed by the way in which um, something like the uh, street is incredibly persistent it is it is wonderful it goes you know it, it's a very durable um, piece of a city generally, if it's treated well. That's a battle that CM lost a long time ago. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah, the Athens Charter and yeah. Uh, yeah, you know all that was there. But that that sort of sense of actually, um, you know, being on a journey um, that is full of possibilities, um, that has the unexpected, that has a delight. Hopefully, in the haptic is the one that we continue to do and I would stress we at this point my my great colleagues in this Robert Kennett um, and Nick Jackson who is somewhere at the back having left six months ago but still dear to us I must say and sorely missed um, and then uh, Lee Higson I'm just skirting around the room Tanya Parkin is here um, and and others we have been working as a brig uh, you know kind of uh, a, a group 
uh, for a long period of time, sort of uh, 25, 30 years, and it's, it's great, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a point at which um, we hope that some of those bigger buildings uh, happen, but also, I think, uh, touchingly, you know, in, in uh, volume four, when I look back at it, it's the small projects that are equally as important as those larger ones, um, and what runs through it um, is actually the other the other parties to thank who aren't there. Some of our dear clients are here, um, but are the uh, all the people who go to make these. And I think that sort of third part of the process of making is one that just gets swept over <laughs> the the drama of uh, making the heroics of kind of making basements and pieces of uh, large pieces of material and putting it together in awful circumstances really and i think we should uh, we should still despite the criticisms be uh, be see the potential and harness the potential of a great industry actually the construction industry um, at all its different levels so um, i think we should draw this to a conclusion have a drink and um, in these very friendly uh, surroundings. So, yeah, thank you all for coming hugely. And uh, I, I can only say that I'm and we are humbled by the efforts that Jay and Eddie and Joseph thank you hugely for undertaking it. it I think it's uh, it's something that uh, is they they started out as a way of um, documenting what we do in the practice. So it is really that in order that. Uh, all those who work on the projects um, could have something to uh, take away whilst the dust is settled on on the excitement of the day to day something that resides and has a has a permanence and thank you for contributing to that there is a group of people who are deeply deeply thrilled that you all have uh, done what you've done incredibly important I know it's a you know it's not a large circulation it's a modest publication, um, but it, I think it, it has a richness thanks to your efforts, so many thanks. Yeah.